Well, won't you remain standing for a few moments? We just want to take some time as we as a community head into elections this week just to just speak into that moment. And for those of you online, would you prayerfully just consider what I'm saying as well? Even though you're in another country, pray for us as well as we as a country and as a nation head into elections. You might ask these questions, what do we as Christians do? But, but what has Jesus said about this? He says that we will be known by our love one for another, not by our politics. And I'm not saying don't vote. Please go out and vote. We need to vote. We need to make a difference. The words of an Irish leader, Patrick Otuma, says, agreement has really been made, has really been the mandate for people who love one another. So if we start making agreement the objective in our family, in our community, in our nation, I think we've missed the mark. We need to learn to understand through love. And how do we do that? Maybe this week, take the time to chat to someone at work, in your workspace, in your daily lives that you don't normally interact with, but you don't really know them. You don't really know their history, where they're from, what they're about. I'm not saying you need to agree with them, but take time to listen and understand. And then maybe have a moment of prayer with them before we go into elections so that we can go and make a difference. So, so won't you bow your heads with me at this point in time as we pray as a community as we head into this week. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to go and vote again in a free and fair election. Lord, South Africa has been such a shining star to the world when it comes to this. Yes, we have our problems. We're not sticking our heads in the ground like ostriches. But Father, we know that your hand has been on this country. We see it in our lives. We see it every day. So we ask you, Father, as we go into this week, just be with our nation. Just let peace reign, O oh God. Every polling station, let your blood just be there and cover that there's no violence, no intimidation, that we would be free and fair to make a difference in this society. And as Tom said the other day, let us go and enter the city. So we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thanks. Let's continue to worship him this morning. Make me your best. 
There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Friends, there's three things that I'm fully convinced about. I'm fully convinced that Jesus is real. I am fully convinced that there is power in the name of Jesus. And I am fully convinced that He is at work in the life of people. And all week, this song has been going around and around and around in my spirit. And every time I see your faces, and I am convinced that this morning we have an appointment with Jesus. I'm convinced that this morning He stands with arms open saying, I'm here and I'm ready and I wanna break some things off some lives this morning. So whether you are a Christ follower or whether you are standing here this morning saying, yeah, I'm not really sure about this Jesus thing yet. How do you know that there's power in the name of Jesus? Friend, let me tell you, I've seen Him work time and time and time again. I've heard a doctor's diagnosis and I've seen him do something else. We have been in seasons of lack financially and I have seen the hand of God provide. He is at work in the life of His people. So this morning, regardless of where you are at, maybe this morning you just need to open your heart a little bit further, stretch it a little bit wider and have just a mustard seed sized piece of faith that says, Jesus, whatever you wanna do, I'm in. Whatever you need to do in me, I'm in. And with an atmosphere of faith, we're going to sing this song. We're going to raise the roof and we are going to see things fall off in Jesus' name. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Because yeah. there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus.
morning we're grateful that you are at work in the lives of people. We're grateful that this morning in this room, chains have been broken in Jesus' name. And Lord, we're grateful that as you look across this room, you don't see a crowd of people. You see the one. You see us. You see me. And Lord, there's nothing that blows my mind more that the God whose hands flung stars into space, the God whose words divided night and day, knows my name, calls my name, knows your name, and calls your name. And he says that we are loved and that we are his. There's nothing more amazing than that, friends. So we thank you for your presence, Jesus. And together we said, Amen. Amen. Welcome once again to our service this morning. My name is Garth. It's absolutely awesome to have you with us. And for also all those online, we appreciate that. I'm going to ask the team to pass the baskets around now as we continue in our worship in giving. And we just want to acknowledge and say thank you to all those that give online. We, we do appreciate that. And for those that are visiting for the very first time and this is not something you're used to, can you help us just pass the baskets around? And that's your involvement for that part of it. And we appreciate that as well. So thank you. So directly after the service, we are going to be having Engage One, and I would love to connect with you and meet with you. That will be right down here on your left, my right at the stairs. So directly after the service, if you're new here, you want to find out a little bit more about what happens here at Grace, come connect with me, and I'd love to have a chat with you. And then financial peace, which starts tomorrow here at Amschlange, just so that you know, applications or signups are closed. We've reached our capacity. So we are taking no one else. But if you really, really want to do it, you'd have, you could sign up at our Riverside or our Belito campus and you'd have to go there to attend the course. But the course here at Amschlange is closed. And then on the 19th of May, I did notice a few people come in at 8 o'clock this morning. I'm not sure about now, but from the 19th of May, we have in a service time change. So please be aware it's the 19th of May. Our first service will be at 8 our second service will be at 9.30 and at 11. The PM service does not change. That stays the same. So please be aware. We are uh, updating you on social media, so get connected there. So won't you turn your attentions to the screens as Duke tells us what's coming up next at Grace. Hi, I'm Duke, and welcome to Grace Family Church. We're in a series at the moment called Help, I'm in a Family. And as a family sitting here today, we want to let you know about some incredible events coming up that we can all get involved in. Each year, Grace Counseling hosts the Christian Counseling Conference, and this year's theme is marriage. If you're married or you've witnessed a married couple, you'll know it's not all cheesy selfies and romantic surprises. Marriage takes work. This year's speakers are both local and international, including strengths-based marriage author, Alan Kelsey. We really want to encourage you to take a look at the Grace Counseling website, where you'll find details about speakers, sessions, and costs. It takes all types to make a family. And at Grace, we are committed to providing resources and events to facilitate healthy relationships within our family. As a church family, we are called to join God's mission to heal the world. We do this in many ways, and one of these is through the street store. This year, the street store is happening on June 1st at the Dennis Hurley Center, and there are a number of ways that you can make a difference. Firstly, we're collecting new or gently used clothes, shoes, and hats for all genders and ages, as well as balls and non-battery operated toys. You can drop your donations off at any one of our campuses, or you can drop them into the massive shipping container that will be at the Mklanga campus. You can also get involved in our sorting day on May 25th. So bring your whole family as we get donations sorted and packed into boxes. Then of course, you can volunteer at the street store on June 1st. For more details about the street store or to sign up for this awesome opportunity, head to our website or the Grace app. This is an awesome opportunity for groups, friends and family to make a difference. So go ahead and sign up online to be involved. Parents, I know you'll be excited about this one. Have you ever prepared yourself for the day when your kids asked, where do babies come from? Well, our Grace Kids team have thought ahead. Christy Herselman, author of Birds, Bees, and Destinies, 
will be presenting the chat at Grace Mklanga on May 17th. The chat is a talk that empowers parents to chat to their kids about sex. The coffee shop will be open from 6 p.m. and Christie's book will be on sale after the talk. So bring cash or use Zappa. This is one of the most important conversations that parents will have with their kids. So invite friends to join and go ahead and register on our website. You know the saying, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Well, we hope this series, along with the events coming up, will add value to your family life. We've put all of this information on our website and on the Grace app. And make sure you're connected with our online family and our social media too. Mom would be a lion. My dad would be what what animal just you know like it's just like oh, okay. It was quiet and doesn't make noise. That would be a fish. Yeah, dad, you're a fish. My mom would be a horse. Dad would be a gorilla. Probably lions. We'd be the female lionesses because we like hunt together, meaning like whenever we do something, we like always together. Um, we go upstairs and say goodnight to them every day and give and them a hug. And we massage them. Especially dad, because he's working all the time to keep us in school. Like my mom and Ampia, like mean so much to me, I'll do anything to make them happy. Even though sometimes when I do that, I get, go a bit upside down. Make us sit on the chair. And let my mom with the exam. Do what? Let us go to the toilet and stay on it for a long time. When I say something, okay, and he doesn't listen, and then I say it later on, and he's like, what's that? And I'm like, boom, you weren't listening. And especially because he shouts and he shows it off. And I'm like, boom, you weren't listening. Uh, uh, you weren't listening. Yeah. I would love to see my child do that to me one day. Um, well, good morning again from me. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at the Mklanga campus, a part of the Group Life team. It's so good to be together this morning. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online from wherever you are in, this, in the world. Uh, we're in this series called Help. I'm in a family. Now, you can't put your hand up for this because they might be sitting next to you, but, but have you ever said those words? Help. I'm in a family. Uh, this morning, we were chatting with some of the, the team uh, on the worship uh, team and, and the tech guys, and, and, and the, so if the response was, man, that's been some of us. Help, I'm in the family, and, and uh, we want to speak into that. We want to speak life into that, and, and you would have heard some of the resources on there. But today, this morning, I, I want to speak and be able to answer one simple question. One simple question is, is the journey that I want us to go on, and it's this. How do you and I deal with family who are different than us? How can we engage with, deal with, interact with family who are different than us? I'm talking about family members who've made a moral choice that we disagree with or have a set of beliefs that are different than ours. Do you have that family member in mind? I'm talking about the family members that make us cringe, that make us turn away, that, that make us react or perhaps even uncomfortable around. Those family members, how do we engage with them? These are often people who, who behave differently than we do or than we think that they should. These are often people who have made uh, moral choices or lifestyle choices that are different than ours or that may even make us feel uncomfortable. And so how do we interact? How do we engage with these family members? Now, now you may not have family members like that. And hey, that's awesome. I want to come and be a part of your family and bring some of that to you. But, uh, but we've got that in different shapes and sizes in our world. And so you may not have that in your family, but my guess is you have a work colleague that behaves differently than you think they should, that has made moral choices different than yours. You may be studying with someone at university. You may be an acquaintance with someone. And as God was referring to earlier, man, we're heading into a week where as a country, there are going to be people standing in lines who are going to make choices different to the person that's in front of them, mostly. 
And I think, that, I think that's a, a really profound thing to ask. How do you and I engage with people who are different than us? Have you got that person in mind? The reality is that when we encounter something, when we encounter something that we don't like, when we encounter something that we don't like, we have an emotional response to that thing. Whatever it is that you don't like, when you encounter that thing, you have an emotional response. Most of the times it's inside. Some of the times it's like, oh, eh, eh, I'm not going near that thing, right? Sometimes we express that stuff. But whenever we encounter something that we don't like, we have an emotional response to that thing. And psychologically, that emotional response, and this is a harsh word, but it's, I'll unpack it for us, is called disgust. When you encounter something that you don't like and you have an emotional response to that, especially internally, that emotional response is rooted in the idea of disgust. Now, again, it's harsh, but let's dig into it a little bit. Uh, disgust is not something that you and I are born with, right? We don't grow up with the emotional response or emotional trigger of uh, disgust. Let me illustrate this to you for a little bit. Um, my daughter is two and a half years old, and she's awesome. I love her, especially at 4.30 this morning. But we were at the beach uh, last week. Uh, not last week, we went just after the floods. And, um, and if you had been down to the beach, you would have seen it. Uh, just like really sad, sad and, and there's been some people who've done some amazing work cleaning that up. But we went when it wasn't cleaned up. And my daughter goes down, and, and she's sort of like running through the, 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 the rubbish and the litter. And I can't express to you how much sand she actually ate on that morning. And that's just like a once-off. She just loves eating beach sand, especially the one that like is black from oil. Uh, or, or, or afterwards, like she'd behave like okay-ish, and, uh, and we wanted to get her an ice cream, because uh, that's a good thing to do for a two-and-a-half-year-old, sugar. And so we got her an ice cream, and she's walking along the promenade where people walk, where people ride, where dogs walk, where dogs do stuff along the promenade, and my daughter's walking with her ice cream, and it falls. So what does she do? She picks it up and eats it. The other day, um, you'll know this as parents, um, if there's quiet, especially if you're a parent of a little one, if there's quiet in the house, trouble. Amen? So it's quiet in our house, and we think, oh, this is awesome. I, I go through the house looking for where our daughter is, and she's just got a brand new toothbrush, and she's standing uh, near the toilet bowl, just cleaning it. She's casually cleaning it. And then I walk in and she goes, Dad, toothbrush. Bam, straight in the mouth. We, we don't grow up with the trigger of disgust. Hopefully she'll learn it at some stage when we start freaking out enough. But the reality is we aren't born with the emotional trigger of disgust. It's something that we learn over time. So, so the reality is disgust can be a good thing. It, it protects us from germs, hopefully, or just builds them all up. Protects us from germs and other dangers in our world around us. Here's a quick definition. Disgust is a feeling of revulsion, and revulsion, again, is a, a, an intense word, but a revulsion is sort of that moving away, feeling uncomfortable, something turning on the inside, revulsion that is aroused by something unpleasant, offensive, and usually offensive just means different to you, or dangerous. Disgust can be a good thing. It regulates our boundaries between us and the outside world, but here's the reality. Disgust can be incredibly problematic when we put it on to other people. And we do this as society. Traditionally, where we do this, just sociologically, the way that we do this is we project disgust onto people who are different than us, who've made moral choices, lifestyle choices that are different to ours. And so we project that sense of disgust towards them. We can at times even question the humanity or the morality of someone who lives a different kind of lifestyle than ours. And so as a result of that, the same way that we learn to quarantine ourselves from things that are gross when we're little, when we put disgust onto other human beings, we begin to quarantine, isolate ourselves from people who are different than us. William Miller, who's done a lot of research into the psychology of disgust, says this, humans are most likely the only species that experience this emotion. And we seem to be the only one capable of loathing its own species. Man, that's been true of our country, that's been true of our world, and that's been true of my family. And perhaps just for a moment of personal honesty here, as I was preparing for this, I really felt challenged around this idea because to some extent, I'm okay to extend some level of grace and kindness to people a little bit further away from me than my immediate family. So some of you know that I'm involved in a ministry of grace called Red Frogs, and we go to partying environments, and we've just been up at Splashy Fen, and you go around Splashy Fen, and 
There, there are kids taking drugs at the age of 13 and 14 at music festivals around our country. That wrecks me. But to some, for some reason, I, I find it a little easier to extend some level of kindness to them, far easier than it is for me to extend that same level of kindness to someone in my family. Sometimes we're the harshest to those closest to us, especially if they don't look like we think they should or dress like we think they should or speak like they think we should. Now, I wanna make, well, I wanna make one important disclaimer at this point, that throughout our conversation now, in no way am I going to try and address your opinion or your belief. I'm not going to try and confirm whether what you believe is right or wrong or whether your opinion is right or wrong. You're not gonna walk out of here and go to that family member and say, I told you so at the end of this message. If you're looking for that, I understand that because that's easier. But what this is about, what this is about is about how you and I respond to someone in our family and in our world and in our wider embrace. How do we respond to someone that's different to us? And in order to, to unpack that and to look, in, look at that and, and to answer that question, I want to read to you from a, a, a passage in the Bible uh, from Matthew 9. Some of you will be familiar with the story. I'd like to use the message translation because I think it, it challenges us, uh, those of us that have read it before, and perhaps bring some insights using some really beautiful language. But this is the story uh, of Jesus and Matthew. Passing along, Jesus saw a man at his work collecting taxes. That's a fun job. His name was Matthew. Jesus said, come along with me. And Matthew stood up and followed him. And there's context to why that was so easy for Jesus to say to people. Uh, later, when Jesus was eating supper, with, uh, uh, supper at Matthew's house, with his close followers, it's important to hear, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. When Jesus was with Matthew and Jesus' followers, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. And when the Pharisees saw this, the Pharisees were the, the holders of the religious law. They said what was in and what was out. They were the custodians of what was meant to be good in the world. And so when the Pharisees saw this, uh, keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and they lit into Jesus' followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher, acting cozy with crooks and riffraff? Jesus, overhearing them, shot back, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go and figure out what this scripture means, referring to scriptures of old. I am after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Other translations, if you just keep that up for me, other translations have that highlighted section as I desire mercy mercy, not sacrifice. See, what Jesus is trying to say in this, in this moment is he's saying he, he desires mercy, not, not religion, not sacrifice. Sacrifice and, and religion in this context, in this context were intentional acts of moving towards purity. When Jesus says, I desire mercy, uh, not sacrifice, and not religion, he's saying he, he's after people who wouldn't be about looking good on the outside. But, but hear me here, there's times when sacrifice, and, and in this context, religion is good, right? When we intentionally engage in the process of ridding ourselves of some of the things that hold us back from following in the ways of Jesus. Katie has sung, sung into that earlier. There, there are chains on our lives that we need to get rid of in, in order to walk in the ways that God would want us to walk. But I think what Jesus is getting at here, what he's speaking at here really gets to the heart of who we are as people, and oftentimes who we are as Christians, I think what Jesus is trying to say at, in this moment is that it is far easier for you and I to measure the outward appearances of religion and sacrifice and purity. It is far easier to measure those outward things to see whether someone looks good. And in some ways, I think in my life and maybe in yours, particularly with those around us, it's far easier to measure someone's journey by how they look on the outside rather than the process they're going through on the inside. The Pharisees did it then. They judged people by what they were looking like on the outside, and I do it now. I do it now. And so we separate ourselves. We separate ourselves from people who don't look the way that we think they should look, who don't speak the way that we think they should speak, who don't dress the way that we think they should dress, who don't, who don't act the way that we think they should act. And not only do we separate ourselves because of that emotional response of disgust, but I think sometimes more dangerously what Jesus is trying to get at here is sometimes more dangerously than just separating ourselves from those people, we can often stand in judgment over them. 
We can stand in judgment over people who've made moral and, and lifestyle choices that are different to ours. And, and this plays out in a whole bunch of different ways in each of our hearts and lives. For, for some of us, we're outspoken. We see something that we don't agree with and we, we speak up about it. If I'm honest, when that happens in my own sphere of influence, in my own family, I, I tend to actually just shut off and, and move away and disconnect a little bit and, and sit on the couch with my arms crossed as that person smokes outside in my home. We respond to these things in different way, but, but what Jesus is trying to get us, get us to understand here is that when our desire for other people, when our desire for other people is, is, is through the lens of religion and sacrifice, that we want them to look in a particular way in order to connect with them. If that is our primary desire for others, we will always lean away from people who are different to us. It is a natural response that we've built as human beings. And we need to be conscious, that, conscious of that in our own lives. And what I think Jesus is saying here is he doesn't want us to be a people who look at people through our religious lenses, who look at people through this preconceived idea of what it means to be good. Jesus is saying in this passage, I desire mercy. I'm after mercy. I, I want you to be a people who live in mercy. And mercy is this. It's embracing and intentionally moving towards that which is different. We have religion and sacrifice on the one hand, which is about moving towards being better. And we have mercy on this side, which is about intentionally moving towards that which is different. And time and time again, we see this in the life of Jesus. Time and time again, we see Jesus displaying mercy, having meals with tax collectors and disreputable characters. We see Jesus speaking to a woman at the well who had five husbands. We see Jesus allowing a prostitute to clean his feet. We see Jesus time and time again having meals with those that society had cast away and, and rejected and pushed aside. Jesus constantly lived out a lifestyle of mercy, and he invites us to do the same. So how do we do that? How can you and I, in some sense, widen our embrace? How can we widen our will to, to connect with others, or perhaps to say it another way, how can we be welcoming to others before any sort of moral sorting in our own hearts and in their lives? How can we do that? There's a beautiful story from the life of Jesus, and I, I want to just share, share it with you now. And uh, there's going to be a few lines that come up as we go, but, but it's found in the book of Matthew. And uh, just for a bit of context, Jesus had been uh, up on the hillside uh, teaching just an amazing set of, of insights and principles. And as a result of this and his miracles, he'd started to gain a sense of a following. And so he comes now down the hillside into a public area. Now, some people think it was a temple court. Some others just think it was like a public courtyard. But he enters into this courtyard with a crowd. There's a large crowd of people around Jesus wanting to get a look, wanting to ask a question, wanting to get close. And then a man walks into that crowd, a man with leprosy. Now, what we know from the Levitical law and context of the day is if you were inflicted with leprosy, you would have to walk into any public environment. And I want you to just picture this for a moment. Maybe even in this room, if you had leprosy, you would have to walk into these doors and shouts, unclean, unclean. Everywhere you went in public, you had to utter those words, everywhere. Can you imagine, can you pause for a moment and imagine what it must have been like for this man to live a life looking at the backs of people as they turn away in disgust? He walks into the crowd, unclean, unclean, and a gap widens, but one person remains standing in the sense of that crowd. And you can almost picture it for a moment, the man with leprosy is before Jesus and there's a crowd that have now dispersed a little bit. There's a gap between Jesus and the man and everyone else because he shouted his state of being, his perception of who he was. And the man with leprosy says this to Jesus. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Can you imagine what that request must have been like for him? Everyone else is gone. Everyone else is pushed away, but Jesus remains with this man. The story goes on to say this. Jesus reached out and touched him. I'm willing, he said. I don't know how long that, that embrace lasted. Perhaps just for a few seconds, perhaps just for a moment. And then he says, be healed. If I'm honest with you, 
I think so often as Christians, as the church, in my own life, I get the order of the story wrong. Far too often in my own life do I say, be healed and then I'll come near. Far too often as the church, we've said to people, fit into a mold, be healed and then we'll engage. The order of the story matters. What does Jesus do first? He reaches out and he connects. Then he expresses a sense of willingness and only then does he say, be healed. The order of the story matters because it matters to who we are as people. What Jesus is saying to us here in this moment is that you and I need to extend our moral circle to include people who are different to us, to connect first, to connect first, to express a sense of willingness first before there's any process and, 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 and progress in that person's life. But if we're honest, that's not easy. It's not easy to, to extend that sense of, 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 of will to connect. It's not easy to extend that, that embrace to others. So how can we do that? Like, how, how can we actually express the will to embrace with those around us? How can we engage? I think it's about this. It is about intentionally engaging with people who are different than us. Now, I've said some of this, but that first word is really, really important. Intentionally engaging with people who are different than us. You see, the reality is we all approach people unintentionally with our own biases and our own, our own, pre, our own preconceived ideas. We call those, those biases filters, and we all have them. And when we engage with people, those filters define how we interact with one another. The filters that I have of who you are define how I connect with you. And so we need to be intentional about understanding our filters. I think we need to, to have an awareness of our filters. And, and maybe here's just a little insight on in how you can do that. That feeling of revulsion, when you hear or see something that makes you feel a little uncomfortable, a little turning away, a little unpleasant in someone else, that's likely the moment that you have a filter around that thing. So when uh, my sister was 19, I'll just give you a silly example, but um, I was trying to be a good Christian boy and follow Jesus and all that kind of stuff. And my sister walked into our house one day wearing like full goth outfits, the chain around the neck. And I honestly think she actually did it to genuinely spite me and to like get me riled up. But you know what I became aware of in that moment? That I had a trigger inside of me because of how someone looked. Those are our filters. When do you experience that when you see someone, when you listen to someone, when you hear someone? Those are the filters that we have, and they will impact. Can I just tell you this? They will impact how you connect with that other person. But what we see from the life of Jesus time and time again, and what we see from the life of Jesus in the story found in Matthew, is that we need to be aware of our filters. Man, this filter of leprosy was evident throughout society. Jesus was aware of people's filters, but we need to be able to lay them down. So I think the first step to engaging with people who are different than us is to be able to identify, yes, but also lay down our filters. This is so critical in the journey of being able to connect with others. We have filters and they, 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 they are the lens to which we look at others. The second step is this, that we need to seek to understand the other person's filter. This is about getting to know someone, right? Not just their details, not just where they live or who they are, which if they're in your family, you know already. This seeking to understand someone's filters is asking the question, how do you see the world? Why are you responding in that way to those around you? And, and, and honestly, I think this is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to, to engage with our family who are different than us, because we think we know them already, we think we know how they should act. We think we know the traditions they should follow. We think we know how they should dress and speak and look. And usually, in a family environment where there is disconnect, it's usually because it's a disconnect about the filters that you're seeing the world through and the other person is seeing the world through. You've got to have a sense of being able to understand their filters, how they see the world. And if you're going to do this, can I just say this? If you're going to go on the journey of seeking to understand other people's filters, you're going to need to be able, you're going to need to be okay with being uncomfortable. Expect discomfort. Because I know this, in my own life and in our world, any time we want to grow, it's going to take intentionality and discomfort. 
but discomfort is okay. It's not opposed to faith, and it's not opposed to holiness. Discomfort is something that that we are working out of ourselves in every moment of every day as we step into uncomfortable places and have conversations with people who make us feel uncomfortable. It's okay. But as you expect that discomfort, here's my encouragement, seek commonality. Because it is what makes us common that connects us. It's our, it's our humanity that breathes a sense of commonality. Seek commonality. But I know this, that, that as we begin to identify our filters and to lay them down, as we begin to understand someone else's filters, and, and that process is the process that, that, that's uncomfortable and it's about seeking commonality, as we do this, we gain a sense of awareness. And here's the truth. It is awareness of filters that opens the doors to navigating differences. Your filters and theirs. It's the awareness of those filters that opens the doors to navigating differences. And some differences, some differences, they're going to need a response of sympathy. That's not pity. Sympathy. They, some, some, some responses are going to need empathy and some differences are going to require compassion. Compassion is about taking active steps to alleviate the pain of the other person in your family. Some differences are going to require that. Other differences, other differences need to be inwardly recognized and outwardly ignored. Ultimately, ultimately we don't have to agree with the other person, but we can still love one another well in the process. If you take home any thoughts, let it be this today. If you take home one idea, let it be this idea. Believing something and responding to someone are two different things. I'm aware that in this room right now, there are families who are being divided because of belief. What we see in the life of Jesus time and time again is that believing something and engaging in someone, loving someone, connecting with someone, responding to someone, there are two different things. And I I want to speak perhaps a little bit of hope into those situations where you feel disheartened because of what they're doing. Allow God's timing, allow God's pace, allow God's grace, allow his restoration to begin to work into that person's heart as you simply show a sense of willingness, being able to connect as Jesus did with the man with leprosy, I am willing. And we allow Jesus to bring healing into that person's heart and life, to go on the journey with them. It's not our responsibility to change them. Only Jesus can do that. Only the work of the Holy Spirit in someone's life can actually lead to those changes but we can be aware of our filters and connect. I wanna say this to us as a church as Kadia comes up. I also think that for those of us that call this place home or that are going on a journey of trying to figure out what it means to be Christ followers, we need to be a kind of people who live this out. We need to be a kind of people who say, you know what, Jesus is calling us to desire mercy, not religion. to to pursue a lifestyle of mercy, not of asking other people to fit into our lens and our box and how they should look. We need to be a kind of people who live out that saying on the wall, come as you are. Not just there, but here. Not just here, but in our hearts. Let us extend a will to embrace with all those around us. And I wanna say this, and it's so pertinent as we go into the, the week of elections. We need to hear this. That oneness is not the same as sameness. When you're engaging with someone afterwards in the coffee shop and they're different than you, they're dressed differently than you, oneness is not the same as sameness. My hope and prayer for you is that that, that we would be a people who would believe something, yes. Again, I'm not asking you to not believe something. Believe something. But it should never stop us from responding to someone the ultimate question is, what does love require of me? What does love require of me in this moment, in this space? As a way to reflect on that and as a way to to finish our service together, we're gonna take communion uh, now. And so what I'm gonna invite you to do, um, if the hospitality team could stand up now and go to their places, but what I'm gonna invite you to do is to go and collect an emblem, a a piece of cracker and a, a thing of juice, 
to grab that and go back to your seats and hold on to it there. And then we're going to take communion together. Is that okay? Uh, if you'd like to stand up, head towards where the volunteers are, and then we'll take communion together. Just as the last few people collect a communion, to those of you who are joining us online, uh, whatever you have in front of you, that's okay. Uh, coffee and cereal, that's good. This is a symbol. It's not what it's about, it's a symbol. And so as we reflect on this moment, the only reason um, I can say any of the stuff that I've said, the foundation to all of this stuff and the reality of living this kind of lifestyle out, the only way we can do this is because Christ did it for us. I want you to hear that Christ did it for us. He extended his will to embrace from heaven to earth, step down low. He widened the embrace of what society thought was in and out. And he invites us to do the same. And so on the night that he was uh, betrayed before he would go through to the cross, he was at a table with his friends and they were different than him. There were guys that were angry. There were guys that wanted status. There were people from all over. And he knew that through the centuries, all kinds of people would share in this moment. But he took the bread that was on the table and he broke it, as was tradition. And he, he lifted it up and he blessed it and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and eat. It's, the, it's my body which is broken for you. Th this thing symbolizes his life and his death. It's here to show us, as we reflect on this moment, this is here to show us that he is not a God who is distant or far away. He's not a God who, who is worried about your brokenness. Your brokenness does not scare God away from you. In fact, his body was broken so that ours could be made whole. Not only that, we allow his body broken for us to move us and motivate us and inspire us and allow his spirit to, to equip us to move towards those that are broken. We receive this and so we live it out. And so we take this now. We take this bread now in acknowledgement of our brokenness. And maybe as you take this, maybe you would take this in acknowledgement and consciousness of that person who is different than you, in acknowledgement of their brokenness. But in all things, his body broken for us makes us whole. And so we take this together.
maybe as you sit in this moment, you'd just be conscious of your own stuff, that you'd be mindful of the other, the one who is different in your space, and you'd be prayerful in that space. In the same way, uh, as was tradition, as was custom, he lifted up the cup that was on the table, and he did the same kind of thing. He, He raised it up, and he blessed it, and then he said these words. He says, take, drink. This is going to be a symbol throughout the generations of my new covenant. It's my blood poured out, which is a symbol of old. But we would take this now and realize that we live in a new covenant. You see, this idea of covenant is a new way to engage with God. The new covenant that this little juice speaks of in this moment is a covenant of grace. This this little juice in this moment, Jesus' blood poured out for us, is a covenant that says he was willing to reach out to connect with us before we were healed, he made a way. Before we were right, he stepped in. Before we were good enough, he made a way. And so we drink this now in acknowledgement of that. That it is only by the grace of God that you and I can connect with him. It's not about how we look, how we dress, what we say, who we are, where we've come from, our past, our future, what's going on in our lives or our beliefs. It is only by the grace of God that you and I can receive freedom. It is His blood poured out for us that makes us clean. And so we drink this now and acknowledge that. Jesus, it's you that makes us clean, nothing else. Let's pray together. We're so grateful, Jesus, that You showed us how to live this stuff out. And you did it for us. You did it for me, Jesus. You you extended your arms to embrace us all. And I thank you for that. I thank you that that you are the example for us and how to live this out. And, And won't you help us now, God, to live out this lifestyle? Jesus, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you forgive me of the times where I've desired religion and sacrifice over mercy? Would you forgive me when I've disconnected from people who are different than me because of the way they look or talk or act? Forgive me, God, for those times. Holy Spirit, help me now in this moment to extend mercy to all, to be aware of my filters. Holy Spirit, speak into my heart to help me be aware of that stuff. Help me to lay it down, God, and help me to connect with others. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. I really pray that you'd go out into this week knowing in your hearts and in your relationships that believing in something and we must believe in something is different to responding to someone. And we can always live in a lifestyle that says, what does love require of me? We've experienced it now in this moment. Let us go out and live that way. Have an amazing week and uh, we'll see you next Sunday.